you know when it's on. Thank you. And we're live. OK, right. Good morning and welcome to this morning. Um, uh, performance scrutiny panel for people. Uh, I've just got to read out this um, very important information. Uh, this scrutiny committee meeting is being conducted remotely in accordance with the coronavirus regulation and the remote meeting protocol agreed by the council, which will operate alongside the council standing orders to ensure that we continue to take democratic decisions in an open and transparent manner. Can I uh, remind members that this is being live streamed and uh, turn your microphones off, etc. Um, the council standing orders and code of conduct will apply at all times during the virtual meeting in the same way as orderly meetings and members should conduct themselves accordingly. Can I remind members uh, to use the uh, chat facility for the benefit of all those who are trying to watch uh, on the live stream. Uh, when I invite members to cast their votes, uh, you won't see it, I'll see it in the chat room function, but I will make you aware of the outcome of the vote and any abstentions. As well as being broadcast live, the recording version of the remote meeting will be uploaded to the Council's website for public viewing as soon as, the, as soon as possible after the meeting, while translation of the proceedings can be provided upon request and the images and recordings can be used for training purposes within the Council. Good morning, item one. Uh, apologies for absence, please, Neil. Uh, no apologies received, Chair. Yeah. We have uh, a councillor. Sorry, councillor Herbie Thomas will be leaving the meeting around half past eleven, and councillor uh, Deborah Davis has sent her apologies as cabinet member for today's meeting. Thank you. No other apologies. Declarations of interest. If you have any now, make it known. If not, flag it up as we go during the meeting. OK, Trevor, could, could you turn your my, could you turn your microphones off, please? I will say that uh, feedback. OK, we go to um, the uh, end of your uh, review on uh, for the service plan here. Uh, I'm going to call forward Andrew Davis and uh, Deb Weston. Uh, who's going to be presenting for us this morning. Good morning to you both. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, good morning. Um, can, I, can I just note also apologies? Um, a lot of members are operating on blank screens. We, we have a continuation of a, of a, a long-standing problem. I know at least three weeks or more uh, that hasn't been resolved by SRS or Microsoft Teams at the moment. Um, this is not satisfactory. This is just um, operating on on I don't know radio tunes. So uh, could we note that, please, Neil, that we are dissatisfied at operating in this type of forum? Of course, Chair, that's been noted. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, guys. Can you? We're going to go through. Uh, we're going to start at the beginning here of the uh, before we get into the body of your report. So uh, page three, uh, page four, page five. I know that we've got. I'm trying to, no, we're not. There's nothing on there. Sorry. OK. It's thrown me a bit. OK, we come to the end of you, the end of uh, the end of your review 2021. Um, and if we go over, we have page one. And I know that there's a question coming up on page two. Anybody got a question on page two? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? No, I got no questions. No questions? Um, okay. I thought there was a question on overspend, underspend. Page 11, page 2. Oh, yes, yeah. Thank uh, you. Just in our pre-meeting, we had a discussion on this, this area of the report. 
And um, there's a question, is the service area on target with its budget? If not, what mitigations are planned to reduce overspends within this financial year? OK, so, uh, good morning, councillors. So I'm Andrew Powell, I'm Deputy Chief Education Officer. There's um, three of us on the call from Education Services today. So it's myself, Deb Weston and Karen Keane. So um, I'll, I'll take this question. So at the moment, um, spend is on target for this year. Um, you'll see from the report there was a significant underspend last year. It was almost two million. So that was all linked to COVID. Um, significant underspends were largely linked to transport because we weren't having to transport people within the city or outside. We were providing funds for about 75% of original contracts. Also, there was a significant reduction in the out of county placements costs breakfast clubs and there was a lower charge for some regional services such as Sencom. So those charges will be reinstated this year. So we're at the moment we're projecting to be on budget. There is a concern that um, we've had a, a significant number of requests for statutory assessments for students with potentially additional learning needs, which could push up costs for out of county placements. But at the moment um, that's not finalised. OK. Do you want to come back on that, John, or are you happy with that answer? OK, I guess we're happy to move on. Chair, can I add on to that, please, as Councillor Marshall? Yes, you can. Question is um, obviously with the budgeting. Where are we in relation to individual schools? Because I know there's certain schools that have been known um, to to still have cuts or to to make savings, if you will. Um, so it's just the situation of where we are individually, uh, because obviously the COVID um, side of things has improved matters for a number of schools. Um, but where are we with others? Are we going to be watching a number with deep concern moving forward in the next couple of months um, as we move forward and out of uh, COVID, please? Thank you. Shall I take this, Andrew? Yes, please, then. OK, um, Councillor Marshall, it's Deborah Weston here. Um, we've got four schools that are still projecting now a closing deficit at the end of this financial year. That's a marked reduction on last year where we had nine schools who were projecting closing deficits. So as I said, we do have four that are still in that position. One of those schools is um, due to close on the 31st of August this year. That's Kimberley Nursery School. You will be aware that we've taken forward a proposal to amalgamate Kimberley and Fair Oak nursery schools into a single standalone nursery. So the deficit that exists at Kimberley will actually uh, be removed as of the 1st of September. That means we have three remaining schools with deficit balances. They're all secondary schools. Um, they've all submitted deficit recovery plans, which colleagues in finance and myself, and obviously Sarah's chief education officer, are closely monitoring on a regular basis. And this is a robust challenge around that, and we are satisfied that two of those schools will return to a closing surplus position in 23-24. So we feel that their plans are on track to, to reduce that level of overspending. They both currently got in-year surpluses this year, and as I said, they're on track to remove to, to return to an overall surplus position in three years' time, which is really good news. Um, as regards to those other schools. Schools who were in a closing or a projected deficit position and no longer are, primarily because of the significant grant windfall at the end of last financial year. And um, whilst they're out of the red, so to speak, and back into the black, we are again closely monitoring those schools on a regular basis just to make sure that their financial planning arrangements are robust and there's no chance of them slipping back into that deficit position. So I'm satisfied that those, that those checks and balances are in the system now, and that we have got that close working relationship with those schools to monitor that position as we move forward. Thank you. Do you want to come back, uh, Councillor Marshall? Yes, if you don't mind. Um, so basically with this um, whole process, we've learned a lot about working differently. Um, I'm just intrigued, obviously, with the cost savings, if we have learned differently, if there can be any examples of where we are saving money through new found ventures, if you will, um, using virtual um, technology. And if there is any um, that you could advise of, please. Thank you. 
Well, one of the things we're currently exploring is, is looking at post-16 collaboration, whether elements of that could be delivered virtually. So those, it's, it's a, it helps in ways that schools don't have to operate necessarily in the current cluster formations that they've got for sharing curriculum, while still being in line with the curriculum measures set by Welsh Government. It also means that potentially we could um, offer curriculum more across more than one local authority. And when we're considering perhaps Welsh medium schools, that's a real advantage for them where there's very small numbers within each LA. Um, a, a big part of the work we've done lately is actually working with lots of individual schools. It's called the CSSR process, which is celebrate, share, support and refine to look at their learning from the, the pandemic, just what has been effective. Um, it's not necessarily been done in terms of cost savings, but it's in, in what's more effective use of money and what in terms of delivering the best curriculum, the best resource. And again, that could be cluster based resources, ways of delivering um, curriculum, working with schools across the city. So it's very much delivered, sorry, it's very much, very much focused on how to deliver the best education for learners rather than a cost saving measure. But I say collaboration is probably the the most straightforward or top priority we've got for saving funding. OK, Councillor Richards. Yeah, I, I just indicated again, Chair. I noticed, unfortunately, I was on mute uh, when I answered to your, your, your request for a, an acknowledgement. Um, I did ask the question about budgets. Andrew answered and gave an explanation, and I did then try to say Rex thanked him for his explanation and I accepted his explanation. That's just for the minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Forsey. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I noticed that some schools are using their reserves to um, to get to a balanced um, budget. And I wonder whether you're monitoring the in-year deficits, which are um, you, you know, important for um, budgets going forward. Absolutely, Councillor Fawzi. Um, we've got a head teachers meeting tomorrow morning, actually, and um, I'm going to speak be speaking to them um, about a template that I've designed in conjunction with colleagues from finance, uh, which will be going out to schools this week and is asking schools to to kind of justify in a way where their over where their in year overspend um, uh, is lying at the moment. So where there is an in year overspend, we're asking them to outline the reasons behind that and whether that is one off spend in which case obviously there won't be an impact in future years or whether that's recurrent spend and potentially we could be in a situation where those schools are then going into a closing deficit. So we're asking for that information to be returned um, by the end of term and then there'd be some quality assurance undertaken on that over the summer with a, a report to governing bodies then planned for the autumn term where we can where we can outline the issues and the things that governing bodies need to be aware of. Now we're not only doing that for schools within your deficits, also those schools that have got large surpluses and in your surpluses we're asking them well when are you going to start spending this money on the children that are in school what plans have you got because you are holding very large reserves in some cases so as i said we're going to be launching that tomorrow and asking the head teachers to provide that information to us by the end of term and we'll then do some further work on that just to identify as i said any recurrent spend issues and kind of come up with some early warning signs really if we feel there are some problems down the road. So that's something new that we're implementing this year and I'm hoping and that that will be very fruitful. Um, we've also, um, through the EAS and their governor support, uh, their governor training package, we're going to be offering training in the autumn term, um, which I would like to make mandatory, if I'm honest, for chairs of governors, chairs of resources and head teachers, where it, it'll probably just be an hour session where we bring them together to kind of remind them of their, their responsibilities in terms of the budget and give an overview of financial awareness and the situation that the local authority and schools are in at the moment. So I'm hoping that that, will ge that, that general overview um, will just kind of bring those questions to the forefront and um, make people more aware of the situation that we're in at present. Okay. Yes, th thank you very much for that answer. I think that is really important because sometimes budgets can appear 
okay because there's some surplus and then some expansion has gone on um but then you know i'm worried that it might not be okay next year so that's um i think that's an important piece of work that you're um, undertaking there and um yeah th thank you for that i think that'd be you know important to consider some of these things the the, the other thing that sometimes um i think schools find difficult is when grants come through late in the late in the financial year and then they don't have time to spend them before the before the end of the year um and and so i don't know what you think about that situation and how best to cope with it it, it is a challenge and I, last year was particularly challenging because I, I think we had almost five million pounds worth of grants came for schools within the last quarter. Um, whilst government did relax um, expectations about spending that it, some grants could be carried forward into this year. Um, it's difficult, it's, it's head teachers obviously were always grateful for the additional funding, but to actually spend it effectively in a planned way is, is really challenging when it comes at the last moment. Um, as local authority, it's, with, it's very difficult. With, it comes from Welsh Government. We're absolutely going to accept the money, but I, I accept your challenge that it makes it very difficult to have a plan and spend. <coughs> OK, thank you. Any more questions? I can see no Chair, more hands. Yes, Chair? Yes, Tom? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, may I ask a question? Um, at the end of the um, the school cricket uh, school season, do you get all the schools together and say um, when they do the budgets, and do tell them uh, ask other schools how do they save? Is is that information passed on? Because it's important that we know what, what about spending money because some schools are over budget and some are under. So how can we level that out? There's a few different forums. We have the School Budget Forum, which looks at the overall mechanism for funding schools, and that meets four times a year. Um, there's a range of schools on there. There's 20 members from um, there's governors, there's business managers, there's head teachers. Uh, there's also reps from union and um, cabinet members sits on schools forum. Within there, it talks about the particular challenges that are, are being faced, whether it's um, capital maintenance, it could be um, IT systems within the school. Um, so that's a really strong group. It's currently chaired by the head of my server, Nicola Allen. Alongside that, we have the deficit recovery meetings, which are chaired by Sarah Morgan, um, along with uh, members from finance and the schools. And again, there's really robust discussions in, in those meetings about how schools are managing their budgets and how they're, they're operating within their allocated funding. Um, it, it is an ongoing challenge uh, within NAPS, again, which is the Newport Association of Primary Heads and CONCH, the secondary group. Finance is one of those standing agenda items where they're talking about the challenges and how they're, they're overcoming it as a professional group outside of LA support. Um, so there's lots of forums actually where budgets and man management of budgets and effective use of money is discussed. Deborah, I don't know if there's any extra groups you want to discuss? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, from the, the, the 1st of April this year, there's been additional resource put in from the, the local authority as well. So there's a new um, post in the finance team um, who works specifically with those schools that are in deficit or are just out of deficit to help them monitor um, their spend and to challenge them on their spend decisions. And because she works across the, the, the council, she's able to identify things that may be working well in one school that maybe another school hasn't thought about. So it provides that additional level of support and intervention really um, so she works closely with me um, and obviously we link in then with those deficit recovery group meetings that, that Andrew has mentioned so I think that, that, that there is additional challenge that has been put in there now and support the schools to, to hopefully help them address this, this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay we're going to move on now I see no more um, hands up for that. Uh, um, Andrew, are you going to take us through the executive summary from the head of service? 
Um, I I can do just so. Um, I think one of the key things from last year is that <coughs> the way that um, grades were awarded, um, and because of the challenges of COVID, a lot of the performance measures were actually paused by Welsh government. So we've got interim performance measures for key stage four, and key stage five, so GCSEs to ASNA levels. Um, it's it's changed the way that it operates now. So whereas before we used to operate um, a system looking at overall attainment for the whole of the local authority, it's now moved to a system where individual schools have their data and it's not required to um, to merge it up to a local authority level. So we're looking at individual school performance. However, because of the way that um, grades are awarded, firstly through an algorithm and then teacher assessments last summer, um, it was we can't compare to previous performance. And again, this year it's moved to centre determined grades, which are teacher awarded grades. So again, it's a different system. So that's made it very difficult in terms of our overall performance measures to, to report to scrutiny, they've been paused. Similarly with the school closures and um, attendance, which again is another key performance measure, has been paused um, along with exclusions. So the only data we can confidently report on as a whole local authority level is the needs data, which is at the end of the report. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's been a really interesting year of, of having to re-establish how schools work in terms of um, care for children who have of key workers or vulnerable children, alongside having periods of reopening um, operating on COVID safety guidelines, whilst also trying to deliver the um, preparation for the ALN transformation, which comes into place in September, and also continuing to prepare schools for developing of the new curriculum, which comes into place in September 2022. So it's been a complex year. Um, you'll see in, throughout the report that actually most of the actions have completed or have are on track. There are some areas, particularly around inclusion, where we haven't progressed at the same rate that we would have hoped, but happy to discuss those specific questions as we go through the report. OK, thank you. Does any member have any questions on the executive su summary from the heads of service? Oh. Hands going up. No. Okay, I have one for you. And um, in the in the report, um, Andrew, uh, they state that um, it's at the the first paragraph of it, and it's down to the end. Um, education, employment, and training above compulsory school age remains strong, and are amongst the best in Wales. How do you measure? So explain to me how you would measure it's amongst the best in Wales. What formula do you use? Sure, and um, Karen will take this question. This is her portfolio. OK. Good morning, Councillor Radley. Good morning, Karen. How are you? We um, access the data on uh, destinations of young people in a number of ways. Um, the first way would be through our links with schools and work with schools to um, identify those young people who have a secure and planned destination um, when they leave school. And we are then able to identify those young people who do not have that planned destination and put in place intervention and support for those. And our work to identify those destinations has already started this year. Um, working with schools before young people leave schools. Uh -huh. And we know that our processes are strong. We have feedback from the All Wales group in relation to the practice that we have in Newport and how they would like to see that practice replicated in other local authorities. And certainly regionally as well, we are uh, recognised for the good practice that we employ to find young people destinations and the follow up that we make when young people do not have a secure destination. Now last year our performance was above the Welsh average because all local authorities report the same data as well. So the number of young people who access the destination in Newport is better than that of the all Wales average. However, there was um, a challenge for us 
last year, and I'm sure you will recognise, much of our practice um, when securing a destination for young people involves us finding those young people, knocking on their doors, checking if they are accessing training, education or employment, and if they are not, working with those young people to direct them to some training or uh, employment or education and working closely with Careers Wales and the Regeneration Investment and Housing team and Youth Service to undertake that work. Last year though, because of COVID restrictions, we had a significant challenge in that we couldn't ask two staff to travel out in the same car to visit young people. They were um, a, a significant number of occasions where we couldn't get answers to addresses that uh, we had for young people. So there were, there were no replies. And what that has resulted in is the number of young people with an unknown destination being higher than we targeted. And um, as a result of that piece of work, that is an area that we have focused on this year, starting our work much earlier whilst young people are still in schools so that we can um, support young people into a destination where possible. Uh, can I thank you for that uh, in-depth uh, answer? I was really asking how do you measure your amongst the best in Wales? Um, you have answered that and uh, I don't think there's a single measure um, I think it's 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 by a collective acknowledgement rather than a measure. So um, thank you for that answer. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, we've got. Uh, I'm sorry, Trevor Watkins, Councillor Watkins. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's one on attendance. Uh, I know that Estin have suspended the um, attendance type thing to look at, um, but are we as a local council monitoring the attendance on when we have home learning to see whether it has been successful or whether it hasn't been successful and how are we actually monitoring it? Um, I'm happy to answer in relation to attendance. Um, good morning, Councillor Watkins. Good morning. Whilst we don't have to report attendance nationally, no. over the last year we have asked schools to report their attendance daily um, and we gather that, that uh, data daily from their SIM system and we continue to share monthly attendance data with all schools so that they can use that data to inform their own practice. But also it um, helps us ensure that the work of the Education Welfare Service can be targeted to support schools, young people and their families who are most at need of intervention, guide, guidance or signposting to other services. So there's no statutory requirement uh, for us to collect attendance data this year, but we continue to collect and share that data with all schools. <coughs> Okay, for the benefit of the individual schools to see whether they what they are doing is successful or not. I understand that it's not a requirement to um, collect that data, but uh, I was rather concerned that um, I'm going to say that NCC are not monitoring it, you know, to see whether we have been successful in regards to the home learning project. Okay, and I, I can confirm that we are collecting that, as I mentioned, on a daily basis, but also yeah. sharing that monthly with all schools. Excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Thank you, Chair. Uh, qu uh, question to uh, Canon, if I may, please. Canon, you know, you um, you mentioned um, about the businesses. How many businesses are on board to help you with p students who have left school? Um, in terms of their destinations, we have um, we have a range of training providers who meet with us on a half termly basis and meet specifically with the youth engagement and progression framework coordinator. And um, there are a range of training providers and employers locally, and they are all committed to working with young people. And there is a strong group of those employers, and they have continued to meet. 
um, throughout the, the pandemic. We also work closely with the Right Skills Group, which is part of the, the Public Service Board. And again, there's a strong link with employers there. You know, I, I, I can say we've had our challenges over the last year, um, particularly with smaller business and smaller employers, and I think that's completely understandable. But we know that that long term commitment is there, so it's just re engaging those those employers as they um, strengthen their practice over the coming months. OK, are you happy with that? more question, please? Chair, yeah, please. Yes. Um, um, children with um, additional learning needs. Um, do you get any help from the business um, people uh, to get jobs for them? Because they, they need to work as well. Thank you. The young people who um, have um, an unsecure destination are often those learners who have an additional learning need. And we would recognise that that is, is occasionally a barrier to their um, access in employment, training or education. But we support those individuals in the same way as we support others. And particularly our links with training providers are strong in that area so that we can support learners with ALN into a destination. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Forsey. Uh, thank you. I wanted to follow on from the education uh, from the attendance um, rate question. Um, normally, schools report attendance and, and they have targets of, say, you know, 92 percent or 90 percent or something. But I wonder if this is a bit of a blunt way of measuring it and that you could have um, a couple of poor attenders in amongst a class of generally good attenders. Um, um, and, and they don't get picked up in the same way as perhaps if you had other ways of measuring attendance, such as how many pupils attended 80% of the time and how many pupils attended more than 90% of the time or some other way of measuring it. So um, whilst I recognise that the past year has been a very strange year with regard to attendance, I, I wonder whether you considered other ways of, of, of looking at it. So in relation to attendance target, um, the Welsh Government has suspended that requirement for schools, so we, we haven't asked schools to set targets for um, performance measures this year. However, we've indicated to schools that if they can set their own target for improvement, that will help them with their own monitoring. And most schools, if not all schools, set targets for not only cohorts of learners, so year groups or the whole school itself, but for individual learners as well, based on securing improvement from their previous levels of um, attendance. And that does help schools identify learners, for example, with attendance below 80%. And we would count those learners as having persistent absences from school so that intervention and support can be put in place for those individual learners. So there's very specific targeting of young people as well <coughs> as that group targeting as well. And I know primary schools in particular are very um, used to using target setting with classes and incentivizing attendance for whole groups as well as individuals. Whereas in uh, secondary schools, you have that incentivising mainly for you groups. Uh, th thank you. That's that's really good because the numbers that tend to be reported in the head teacher's report is just the 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 overall, isn't it? So um, yeah, thank you for that answer. Councillor Marshall. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. My question um, lies in the section of improving school uh, standards. Um, so obviously during COVID, it's been a very different situation about the limitations of people allowed into schools and things like that there, um, and everything obviously turning virtually. Um, so my question is just how have we, um, you know, from a local authority basis, um, just overseed um, what was actually happening at the schools, you know, just monitoring just to ensure that the um, standard was kept up to it 
to scratch, so to speak. Um, did people sit in virtual lessons, for example? Um, and then leading on, you know, what, what about those with free school meals and things like that as well with the attainment? I know that's a big factor as well with those that have access to the digital, um, you know, world and digital inclusion and things like that there as well. So it's a, again, how we improve standards to, for everyone um, to make sure that no child is left behind. Thank you. Um, this has been a really difficult area over the last year um, and it's been quite contentious. So how do I how do I start answering this? So we haven't been able to go in in the way that we would have to schools and for example to carry out reviews or follow up reviews. Similarly, Estin have not carried out monitoring visits. Mm -hmm. It's very much on the basis of um, well-being visits and about generic support for head teachers. So having those regular ongoing conversations, whether it's LA staff, EAS or ESTIN, but it's not tracking performance in the way that we have previously. We did put the CSSR meetings, the celebrate, share, support, refine processes in place, um, which was a chance for schools to share the challenges and the successes that they have had with um, LA and EAS representatives and the, there's been lots of actually really positive work that's come out of that in terms of the development of blended learning, community engagement and support for for families who particularly have, have struggled to access online learning and um, schools have talked about support they've provided to families to um, for example just log on to their online platforms, be able to use the computer systems and provision of, of paper act activities where appropriate and about just general community development work. There's been significant union involvement across the city and across Wales actually about um, quality assurance activities being completed within schools. So this has impacted on head teachers actually carrying out, um, for example, lesson observations, book looks, learning walks. It's um, Everyone has had to take a step back this year and think of different mechanisms of, of actually completing quality assurance activities. So one example I could think of, I met the school last week, they were talking about how they've used Google Classrooms and it's been um, senior leadership going on to look at the work that's been submitted through Google Classrooms to just have a, a sense check. Is it, are the are learners engaging? Are they completing work at the right level? Is the quality of provision being offered to the staff appropriate? It's, I, I don't think anyone would argue it's been as um, comprehensive or as thorough as we would have liked, but within the circumstances we had to operate so it was safe for schools. So one example is even books, having to quarantine books um, for, for an external person to look at them, um, not having external visitors going into classrooms because there's not enough space to have someone observing whilst completing a social distance. So challenge advisors have, have continued to support individual schools. They've supported heads to complete quality assurance as best they can. Um, but we recognise this is something that needs to be re-established once it's COVID safe to do so. Do you have a, are you satisfied with that um, answer? Thank you, Che. Um, can I ask on, um, so when we're talking about COVID recovery, um, what do we see happening now? Do, do we see a, a major challenge to what has happened or do we see it kind of like sinking in? Where, where do we see ourselves um, and is it going to be a struggle moving ahead in the next year or two years, three years, etc.? Um, one of the, the areas we're actually keeping a very strong eye on is, is um, social and emotional development of children, well-being and helping them to, to recover, to build relationships and be able to re-engage back in school. Recognise particularly in early years, there's children that wouldn't have accessed nursery or preschool activity, which is a, a huge part of their socialisation and beginning to engage in education. So some children haven't, they haven't had any of those opportunities over the last 18 months. Um, we've had some schools report behavioural challenges of pupils returning after um, lockdown where perhaps they've had minimal socialisation, the structures that they've used to have, have gone. 
so I think in terms of learning, we, we know the systems that promote strong learning, um, but it's that well-being aspect. I think it's going to be the challenge and underpinning that a lot of the support we put into schools. Um, the blended learning approach that's been developed, I think has been really strong. We want to draw on that. We've provided a lot of support to schools for them to share good practice amongst themselves. You want to see that built into the new curriculum that's being developed. Um, but well-being is, is going to be the core, and I think that's the challenge that we face in the future. And Karen might want to come in here for an additional point. Struggling with mute. Struggling with mute. Um, good morning, Councillor Marshall. Whilst I, I, I sense that you're really interested in um, young people's engagement in their learning during that period of, of school closures, and whilst we all appreciate, I think, that how important it is to support young people's well-being, I can share with you some data which highlights how often young people engaged with HUB. Now, oh, I think all of you will be aware that HUB is the, the platform that schools and most schools use, that young people log on to HUB and um, schools would have uh, placed their, um, a range of learning activities for young people to, um, to engage with uh, whilst they were learning at home. So I can give you some comparative data from September 2020, where all learners were in school, to January 21, where we know that learners were learning at home rather than in school because of that period of school closures. So in September 2020, there were 42,297 logins to Hub. OK, so just over 42,000. Um, 19,254 of those were from students in schools. And there were 25,961 logins to Office 365. So that's where learners would be using Word or Excel or whatever to complete their, their work. So when we look at the data from January, we can see the, the difference. So hub login September 42,000, hub logins in January 21, 141,733. So we knew do, during that month, that's how many times people were logging into hub um, to engage with the learning activity. And 97,615 of those logins were from young people in school in Newport. And where the Office 365 login, so where they were working on PowerPoint, Word, Excel, whatever, there were 71,916 logins. So whilst we can't comment on the quality of the work or the, the type of work, what we can say is that they were, there was a significant increase in the number of young people who were engaging in online learning during, during that period. And I think that's a really important measure for us in terms of understanding how schools were providing learning for young people during that time. OK, thank you very much for that comprehensive question. Councillor Lacey. Um, thank you. Um, it's, just, it's a question really relating to, similar to the um, attendance, but I'm just wondering how many children we lost to mainstream education that dropped into homeschooling from since since we've gone back and then how are we monitoring how are we monitoring those and, and, and how, how that, you know, because obviously there's going to be an, a, a knock on effect over the coming years if they're not educated properly. So just to be interested to find out how many how many we lost. I know how many I lost in my own in my school that I'm a governor of um, and I was quite shocked that it was quite high. So going across the whole of Newport, if I could get some stats on that, if I may, please. Good morning, Councillor Lacey. Um, we currently have 207 young people that we are that are known to be home educated at present, and that is it, it's roughly double what it was in the, the previous year. So a significant increase in the number of home educating um, families. To ensure that we are supporting those families and um, ensuring that young people who are being home educated can access an appropriate um, education. 
the Education Welfare Service engages with all families who wish to home educate their children within 14 days of the family making that initial request. And then the Education Welfare Service make annual visits to all of those families and actually they are undertaking the visits and this week and next week to look at the type of activity that those young people are being asked to do at home. So there is that um, annual level of scrutiny which the um, guidance that from Welsh Government allows us to do. We are though acutely aware that what we, we would like is for um, young people who have recently become home educated to perhaps re-engage with school and so we are working with um, dragons in the community to put on some um, family activities um, where we engage those young people and their families and try and re-engage them in, in um, statutory education or education in schools. And similarly, we are using uh, the support of Gwent Music again to run some activities for those families with the aim of re-engaging them. As well as re-engaging though, we recognise that some families want to um, home educate their children for their own philosophical reasons. So where there are families who um, intend to home educate their children for, for long periods of time, then that's an opportunity for us to make links with those families, to make sure we're signposting those families to support and other services. Um, that can help with that education at home. But there, there's a lot of support and monitoring that is ongoing. And we are fortunate to have received some funding from Welsh Government for this academic year, which will allow us to increase the levels of support and contact that we have with home educating families over the next um, academic year. That's, that's great. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Like I said, it was. I was quite shocked, and and you, you know, we're doubly. Hopefully, I'm hoping myself that we might see them re re sort of going back into mainstream education come September when things have settled down, and you know. But it's good to know that we're really pushing forward with. You know, we're not losing them. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Chair. Right, Mike. My question is about the well-being of young people in schools when they have an accident. <clears throat> I know it's not to do with education, but it is. We sh we have a duty of care to these young people. Um, a seven-year-old fe fell off a log last Thursday in school, and this was in playtime in the afternoon. And then for an hour and a half, she had to sit on a bench with a cold paper towel on her arm. No other first aid was given to her. Are the staff first aid trained or whatever? This was my question. And surely there should be new procedures put into place about the first aid that is given to young people when they're in school. Her mother actually worked in the school and she wasn't even alerted or informed that she'd had an accident and didn't know until she got home that evening. Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not quite sure whether that's a point for this scrutiny committee. It's a very good point, however. I'm absolutely interested in the reply. Um, so whether you want to give the committee or give members uh, a fuller reply after you've investigated the facts. Um, but I guess, can you just reply with regards to, um, or give us the reassurance that we have adequate on-site first aiders within um, within the school setup. So, Chair, I, I don't really want to give a response related to an oh. individual school here. Oh. Um, there is there is an expectation that schools would have appropriate first aiders within the school and that their their training is in date. Um, if there is a concern about the way the schools handled it, then it should be um, put through the individual schools complaints policy. Um, however, outside of this meeting, if, if you want to raise which particular school you've got the concern is, I'll happily follow it up and, and check that the systems are in place. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Thank you, Andrew. I've already sent an email to the edge yesterday and I've had no reply. Okay. okay. 
Okay, thank you, um, thank you, Councillor Clemby. No problem, you're very welcome. Be ongoing. Councillor Seller, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to uh, Karen, please. Karen, um, these the homeschoolers right now, how are they? How are they graded? How, um, a, B, and C. How, how do they grade them now that they've been homeschooled? Do, do the parents grade them, or do uh, outside bodies uh, grade them, please? Okay, so there's there's no requirement for parents who are home educate their children to follow the national curriculum. And there is no requirement for parents who home educate their children to arrange for them to take examinations at 16 or 18, should they wish to continue um, with study until then. A, a number of parents, though, do choose to um, enter their, their uh, children for examinations, particularly GCSE examinations. And so they would um, ask a local school to act as an exam centre for their child. And um, in fact, the Bridge Achievement Centre is, is available for any home educating parent if they wished to, um, to undertake that, that route. But there is no requirement on home educating families to arrange any form of assessment or examination for children at, at 16, at 18 or even younger, uh, you know, at the end of Key Stage 3. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, may I ask more question, please. Uh, yeah. um, what's the success rate of homeschooling? Have you any uh, statistics, please? Um, in in terms of destinations for young people, um, we would count them in the, our own destination survey and um, support as many of them into education, training, or employment as possible because they are known to the career service. So we would pick up those young people via via the career service and support them with their, their careers officer. But Councillor Seller, that is the young people that we know about. There is obviously always going to be a possibility that there could be young people that we don't know about. OK, thank you, Councillor Marshall. Thank, thank you, Chair. Chair. Um, I do have a couple more questions before I'm done, if that's OK, Chair. So if you want to split them up, that, that's fine. Um, one of the questions was in relation to the most vulnerable learners. Um, again, mentioned that the free school meals, non-free school meals. Um, how are we monitoring the attainment differences um, in this difficult world and how are we going to meet the challenges moving forward to make sure that, again, the attainment is, is not um, you know, wider, that the gap isn't wider. Um, and that's the same for the looked after children. Um, or obviously something as corporate parents that we have to be worried about is what, what you know, support are we given um, to young people? Um, and then the other part of that would be linked into additional le um, learning needs uh, students. Um, what support has been given them, you know, uh, given to them during COVID, um, especially when it was the virtual means, because a lot of it takes place face to face, um, you know, and, and technology can be one barrier in place. Um, so it's just interesting to hear, first of all, from that, if you don't mind, and I'll come back with a, a further question after. Thank you. So in, in terms of the most vulnerable group, so perhaps I'll merge this all together. So we've got free school meal, looked after children and ALN. So, so within, because of the change in performance measures, how it's now based for an individual school, those um, checks and balances of how, how those individual learners are progressing still takes place. So this is where the challenge advisor has the specific role to work with the head teacher to look at cohorts and individual learners and how they're progressing. Um, against individual targets that were set for them. So that works ongoing. The use of the pupil development grant PDG for free school meal learners, although we weren't able to evaluate the impact of those grants last year because of the, the range of school closures, the planned spend and the actual expenditure was um, checked by both local authority and the challenge advisors. And um, we use the Sutton Trust Toolkit, which is a, a, an evidence based approach that shows which interventions have the best value for money. And we would expect schools to plan a, using that Sutton Trust Toolkit um, and they submit their grant plans to a central portal, which are checked by both local authority and EAS. So those checks are still going on. Um, for our looked after children, we've got the looked after children's education coordinators who are 
based in children's services and managed through children's services. Again, they work with individual learners. They're more focused on those children in secondary schools because we know looked after children in primary schools generally do, as well as their peers, the gap um, appears in secondary school. So this specific work that's taken place there. Last year we received an additional grant um, via the EAS um, to support our vulnerable learners. And we passported that to children's to services to increase the hours of the looked after children education coordinators, specifically to work with those looked after children or vulnerable le learners who were beginning to dip out of school, perhaps weren't engaging with blended learning to the same extent as others, and to have a more focused individualised response for those learners. Through the period of school closures, schools did operate um, face to face provision for um, children of key workers and vulnerable learners. So we established a, um, a risk assessment tool to look at all each individual learners um, and to see where they fell on, on the school's balance of risk. If there were specific home circumstances where schools and, and children's services felt the children should be better placed attending. Where that was the case, um, these children were offered places in school and the majority did attend. There were some that didn't. Um, so we've tried to capture those most vulnerable to identify them on this risk assessment, bring them into school, plus have other checks and balances around. For, so for example, the looked after children education coordinator, education welfare service. Last year we also expanded the school based counselling service so that had always operated on a face to face basis, but last year we expanded it so there was an online support, there's telephone support and also that was expanded to families and those caring for individual children. The educational psychology service also operated a phone line support for those families who are actually worried about how to best support their children if, if they had an additional learning need and they were just just needed someone to talk to or they just needed some extra advice. So there was a lot of additional wraparound that was put in place last year. Um, does that answer your question, councillor? Is there anything extra? Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. It's um, obviously quite reassuring to, to know that there was actually provisions put in place, such as what you mentioned, uh, more so than what I thought. I know some happened at school uh, or schools, but obviously not to the extent um, that, that you kind of advise. So thank you and appreciate that. Um, it leads me on to the other one as mentioned. I, I do have one or two more after that, but the you know there's mentions about a calming room and stuff like that there. My main concern obviously that links into you know what we've previously discussed about the well-being of young people within the city and about you know are we ready to to kind of meet this new potential challenge coming at us um you know in this recovery period the fact that we're probably going to have a lot more young people having to to have to to utilize calms um you know the well-being service and things like that there are, are we ready? Are we ready as a local authority? Are we ready in the schools? You know, what provisions being put in place to, to make sure that we are, you know, um, kind of fully ready and not having long waiting lists and things like that that we've previously seen. Thank you. So when this um, end of year service plan was submitted, this was a significant risk that we, we flagged up at that point. We've, we've noted there was a, a significant increase in requests for statutory assessment during the last year, plus um, during a period of school reopening, there were behaviour concerns being flagged up. Since this report was submitted, it's been agreed to expand the capacity of the inclusion team. So it's partly to meet the needs of the ALN and Educational Tribunal Act, plus it's also based on the tracking of, of um, uh, statutory assessments. So we have Additional staff will be employed and currently recruitment undergoing for additional educational psychologists, for members of the SEN team, for teacher advisors. So the whole purpose of this is to increase the capacity of schools to support learners. They are working alongside the requirements of the Code of Conduct, sorry, Code of Practice for the Education and Educational Tribunal Act. That starts to come into place for September. However, we're still waiting for some guidance from Welsh Government on the um, 
specific elements of it. It's called and during the we're waiting for commencement orders to be established from Welsh Government, which give finer detail on which cohorts will be subject to the ALN and Educational Act tribunals because it's being implemented on a, a phased basis. One of the issues we've got at the moment is our special schools are full. So there's a consultation undergoing at the moment to expand our school Brindero um, using the site of Kimberley Nursery. We've also expanded provision through um, independent providers such as Catch 22 and Newport Live. Um, we don't want people having to go out of county where schools, mainstream schools can't manage their needs. So we're trying to expand independent provision within Newport because it feel it's the best outcomes for those learners to be managed close to the communities. Um, it remains a challenge and I, I think as as the next year starts, we'll see more of the impact of COVID. But at this moment, I, I can honestly say I feel we're doing all that we, we can do. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, before you come back, Councillor Marshall, uh, you seem to be going through a lot of the questions on the service plan update, um, which is which is great. Uh, the, the great qu qu questions, uh, but we've got to go through the service plan updates. Um, so can I ask you to keep the rest of your comments till we go through the appropriate plan update? Uh, is that OK, Councillor Marshall? That, that's fine, Chair. I said you, you're more than willing to stop me as and when, so that's fine. That's OK. Thank you. Um, Councillor Townsend, on, is it on the, um, the report that went through, which was the uh, ex the summary from the head of service, or are we going on to the service plan updates before we take any more questions? So, sorry, Chair, were you asking me that? I was. Oh, I was yeah, it is your question. Yeah, uh, mine was. It's the simply an update, uh, or to the executive summary from the head of service. I don't think it's either of those, Chair. I was simply going to comment or ask a question on um, children who are home educated and the uh, doubling of the numbers. And we were told that um, children are not subject to uh, being taught the national curriculum, nor do they have to take external exams or national exams. How then do these children get into university if that was their end, you know, if that was what they were yeah, head, yeah. heading towards? How does that work? Have you asked your question? So it's a, a great question. Um, can we have an answer to that, please? Where there is a, a, a family who wishes their, their child to enter university or there's a young person themselves with aspirations, they would complete GCSE exams. Parents will organise either tutors themselves or will undertake uh, the, the teaching of the curriculum themselves. Uh, you, I, many of you will know that you can access the uh, exam specifications from the WJEC website and parents can make use of that and then they can enter young people for exams to, or to complete exams as a private candidate either in any of the schools across the city or the Bridge Achievement Centre and they they will act as that examination centre for um, any individual learners who wish to take their GCSE exams or A-level exams as a private candidate. However, parents have to arrange that themselves and organise all of the teaching and the assessment required if they are home educating their sons or their daughters. OK, thanks, Karen. OK, thank you. Councillor Forsey, is it relating to page three, the executive summary head of service report? Um, uh, no, I, I thought if we'd gone on past that. Um, My question is relating to page 28. Well, well, just well, hang on to your horses, Yvonne. <laughs> we'll be there soon. We're going to be travelling. As uh, and can, can, can I thank you for all the questions and indeed the answers, because uh, you've um, you've really gone gone on ahead. Um, okay, so page three, page four. So we've got it down as page thirteen. Um, my copy is page four. So page four. We go over now um, 
And to start the service plan update, it's on page five. Any questions on page five? Any questions on page six? Any questions on page seven? Any questions on page eight? Any questions on page nine? Any questions on page ten? Any questions on page 11? Yes, Chair, Councillor Marshall. OK, well, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so on uh, page 11 or page 20 on the, the report for um, members, um, it notes about weapons in schools and about violence, violence mm -hmm. reduction. Um, I'm just keen to find out what the situation is in relation to concerns um, from residents that I've been made aware of. The fact that they feel there's an increase or potential increase about to happen of young people that have been on the streets and things like that with bad influences um, and the, the potential for increase of weapons being brought into school. Thank you. And I suppose the sep the question, so we could get it all out when I have, has this been implemented and, um, and, and, and can you give the details of any implementation of the scheme and what results have we had? OK, so the, the managing weapons in schools policy was initially developed as a joint piece of work between the Youth Offending Service and the inclusion team for the Behaviour Advisor. Um, this was about wanting a consistent approach across the city to to prevent the criminal, the inappropriate criminalisation of young people, um, but also to make sure that they and their families were supported to deal with any issues that had led to them taking a weapon in school. Um, this was presented at the Youth Offending Service Boards um, earlier this year, and the police had significant involvement in this and an interest. Um, so police actually became a third partner in making sure that there was a consistent approach to how Gwent Police supported these learners as well. Um, which has been signed off, it's being piloted this term for formal implementation in the autumn. Um, we have had some incidents where it's been piloted this term and it's felt to have been successful in actually supporting the families. I don't really want to talk about specific incidents or schools. Um, any significant our instance involving a weapon would go down the a, a formal route um, and uh, criminal lines. However, it's recognised that this isn't always appropriate for the case because it is criminalising perhaps young people at an early age and hampering their lifelong chances. So we just want to make sure it's appropriately and consistently, consistently managed across all schools. And that can include the, the, the number of days of an exclusion, um, sanctions that take place within individual schools that it's consistent across all of them again this this goes alongside all of the support around well-being we and um, council marshall said this is about potential risks for schools uh, for children having been out of school for a long time so again though as i discussed earlier there was those um, interventions that we've had in place for over a year to tailor, tailor to those children that we know have been dropping out of school um, lots of work from the youth offending service about working with ch our children who have potential to go down a criminal route but making sure that we identify and support them at an early point so that we can re-engage them back into school back into um more appropriate social social activities uh thank you so the um the uh program uh, has been implemented throughout our schools so this is a secondary school that is being piloted at the moment. And it's, it's, it's the intention to have it rolled out to all schools later this year. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions on page 11? Chair, yeah, I've got my hand up. OK, sorry, Tom, you have to be Can the other members take their hands down, please? Unless they're up for a specific page, I don't know. Yeah, 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Chair. My question is to Andrew, please. Andrew, um, are the teachers uh, trained in? Um, uh, are they equipped to be uh, to handle somebody with a knife? And uh, have they been trained? This is very uh, upsetting for them if somebody comes in a school with a knife. And how do they talk them down, please? Yeah, so um, if if there's a person who, who brings us a knife into school in a threatening way, the police would be called, and it's it's it would be for the police to sort that. Certainly, no expectation that teachers would be trying to remove knives or, or handle that situation. We have um what are called evacuation procedures that are in place in school, so that if there's an event that that's um putting individuals at risk, schools know how to um to sequester themselves away or, or, or keep children and staff safe. OK, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Richards. Yeah, on the same point, Chair, um, I mean, uh, as an elected member, I'm sure that my colleagues will be the same. Recently, the publicity on this issue is horrendous. Uh, there was a programme on television a couple of days ago about what's happening in London, for example, and they reckon that uh, knife carrying is at an epidemic level. I would suggest that we class this as an urgent priority in our area, and I'm sure the education uh, section will do that. But um, prevention is better than cure, and we need to start um, progressing this on an urgent basis, I would suggest. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so maybe that could be a recommendation when we come to the end of the uh, the end of this report, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, OK, no one else. Uh, page 11, we're done. Page 12. OK, uh, on page on page 12, item 8. Um, we, we've, we've had discussion on this this, this morning and but uh, where will we be? <clears throat> so not, I notice we're severely in the red zone here, and um, and, uh, and progression has been uh, impacted by COVID-19. But however, where will we be um, at the next reporting? Um, the next re reporting back to the committee at the midterm report. So where do you see us being by then? Um, so in, in terms of this, there's only two schools that have reported having a calming room, and this is the two special schools, Mike Sebu and Bryn Darrow. Um, in terms of the calming room, it, it's only to be used as part of a, a planned behavioural programme that's agreed with parents. So um, the work is progressing. Um, it, it is planned to have it completed in the autumn. So this is being led by Katie Reese, our head of inclusion. I, I don't have the full details on this, and I'd rather um, perhaps ask Katie to give you a written response following this meeting. I'm happy to take that if you could uh, give a written response to all members of the committee, please. Thank you. OK, uh, page 13. Anybody on page 13? Page 14, page 15, page 16, page 17, page 18, page 19, page 20. Yes, yes, Councillor Marshall. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, we'll go Councillor Marshall first and then Councillor Forsey after. Is that OK? Thank you, Councillor Marshall. Chair, did you want to go to Councillor Forsey? Because she's page 19 and I was page 20. Was you page 20? OK, Councillor Forsey. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about how many pupils do we have um, being educated out of county um, and, and why are they being educated out of county? 
OK, I, I don't have the specific numbers of today, but I can I will get those to you following the meeting in terms of why they're being educated out of county. So this is a specific provision that's needed. So we have, um, for example, those with significant um, physical issues um, or of physical and social and emotional issues, they may be attending a specialist um, provision. So, for example, um, we have Headlands School in Planarth. That's a specialist ASD school for um, for and it has a residential provision. We have a um, place at T Corriton, which is for pupils with significant um, health issues. So it's, it's all based on their specific needs. There are also those children that have been placed out of county who are looked after and maybe in a residential care that provides both residential and education provision. So it's a mixture of those placed by the SEN team and a mixture of those placed by children's services um, elsewhere. We've, we've worked to reduce the number of out of county placements um, to increase provision within Newport because we uh, we want the children to be educated in Newport close to their families. However, for some children, the, the requirements are so specialist. There are um, settings that take children from all over the UK. So, for example, T Corriton has children from Cornwall. It has children from Newport. Um, unfortunately, in the past, we've had children replaced in Scotland from children's services because of the level of specific support that they require. OK, thank, thank you. you. I would be pleased to get that information um, later. Thank you. Again, can all members of the committee have a copy of that information? Can I also remind all members, once you've spoken, can you uh, take your hands down, please, as I'm operating with a, I can't even see who's, I can't see people this morning. So if you could take your hands down once you've spoken. Thank you, Tom Toller and Councillor Richards. OK, Councillor Marshall, page 20. Thank you, Chair. Just to advise, Chair, the one in the chat is not held by us. We can't put hands up or down on that. That That's something for democratic services. Um, well, well, people are putting their hands up and they are putting their hands down on what I can see. Um, um, yeah, so that is, and now uh, you, you, you are busy clearing them. So uh, it is on what I can see and I can see when you raise your hand and I can see when you take your hand down. Uh, so I have no control over that. But uh, and we are operating on radio conditions this morning, so please put up with us. Bear, bear with us again. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, would you like to continue? That, that's fine, Chair. Thank you. Um, so it's two questions on page 20. The first one is about the reviewing school funding formula. Um, just intrigued, obviously, over time that we're saying about the energy and the maintenance of buildings. Does that take into consideration, um, obviously, about the age of buildings? Um, some are like grade two listed, uh, et cetera, and all the rest. Um, how does that influence the, the, the way they're funded? Because obviously that, that will raise the costs for that particular school in comparison potentially to a new school, which would obviously have efficient savings on the basis it will be new uh, energy efficient etc there so it'd be interesting to hear thank you yeah Deborah do you want to talk a bit yeah, yeah um I, without going into too much detail that I that I don't have myself I know that within the formula and um, the, the, the as far as the buildings are concerned they're all given a condition factor and then they're funded based on the condition factor of the school. So the age of the school would be taken into consideration around that. And an older school would then receive a higher level of funding than a new school who wouldn't need those, who wouldn't have those building maintenance requirements. I don't have any more detail than that. Again, we can obtain that for you and share it with you. But I am aware that, there is, that these condition factors are assigned within the formula. Thank you. I, I just obviously have experience of a, a local ward one, which I don't want to raise too much, but I know the officer is well aware of what I refer to um, from experience. So I thank her for her for that answer. Um, the other one, um, I couldn't quite see it with the um, Welsh schools, but it's the next point four about the revised secondary school catchment areas. Um, as elected members, this is an issue um, of catchment areas that always comes up, as you probably appreciate. The appeals processes, um, you know, about the, the pupils wanting to get into their 
areas. Um, just want to hear what, what have been the challenges there and, you know, do, do we still believe there they will be more or less challenges moving forward in the future for, for those specific schools of religious or, you, you know, of particular areas or needs such as Welsh medium provision, please? Thank you. Yeah, so, so the, um, the element within this service plan and the review of the secondary school catchment areas specifically related to two areas of Newport. One of those was um, Caerleon, uh, where traditionally um, the, the, the catchment area had extended into parts of Monmouthshire and, uh, and Torvine. So we took the decision that we would consult on aligning the catchment area with the Newport boundary. Um, so therefore it, it, it meant that the children who lived out of Newport no longer had catchment priority for a place. So we took that through consultation. There was lots of feedback, but the cabinet member took the decision that that, that was in the best interest really of Newport and Newport residents. And that was applied for the first time for um, admissions to school this September come in. So we still have received um, applications from families living outside of Newport. And in some cases they have been successful because even though they don't live in Newport, they live closer to that school than maybe some Newport residents. So it hasn't precluded them from applying. It just means that they don't get priority over people who live in Newport. They're assessed in exactly the same way as a non as somebody who doesn't live in Killian. So I think that's that, that's definitely fairer. Right? We have seen a reduction as a result of the number of people applying from out of county for places in Gillian. Um, and I think if I'm honest, that you know, I would welcome that because it does mean then that there are more places available in our school for people who live in Newport. So that was the one element. The other element that this specifically related to was um, the Summerton area, because traditionally Summerton has been part of the Lisweary catchment. Um, and uh, but, but if you look at it on the map, it's actually surrounded by schools that are in the Lamwoon catchment. So in terms of the pupil projections and, and looking at where those pupils were going to be coming from over the next few years, it became apparent that Lisweary was going to be oversubscribed and maybe Lamwoon would be undersubscribed for some time. So that coupled with the fact that we had taken forward a federation proposal that actually federated Summerton and Eves well under one single governing body, we took forward a proposal to move Summerton into the Lamwoon cluster. And again, that was favourably received and this has been applied for the first time this year. And interestingly, Liz Weary, which Summerton has come out of, is um, fully subscribed in year seven for the first time ever. So you can see that it was the right decision to take in terms of our planning of school places and our pupil projections. We do still have pupil projection issues, you know, not issues, but we know that there is a burgeoning population. We've had that effect in, in primary schools for some years, and that is now manifesting itself in the secondary sector. That is part of the reason for our school reorganisation proposal, which Cabinet approved last week around the expansion of Bayslag. And certainly um, that is not the only issue that we will need to look at. And, um, you know, our, uh, whilst it's only at um, kind of an exploratory stage now, uh, we would anticipate that Ban C of the 21st Century Schools programme is going to be heavily focused on secondary provision in Newport, both English medium and Welsh medium. So I have no more information to share at this stage, but just to assure members that that is on our radar and is something that we're acutely aware of from 2024 onwards. OK, Councillor Forsey. Uh, thank you. Related matter, really, um, only concerned with primary schools, that we've had a substantial house building uh, programme in the area. And whilst some additional school places um, have been made available, it doesn't seem like there have been enough places um, available. So I, I wonder how you predict how many children um, are going to be in an area of wanting to attend a local school um, and, and what are we going to do to expand primary um, primary school provision um, in my local area because it seems like it's urgently needed at the moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Councillor Forsey. You know, projections that you know the model that we use in terms of pupil projections does indicate and did indicate a levelling off in the Rogerstone area. You know, it's an area where we have four primary schools very close together, and the projections indicated, as I said, a levelling off, um, which unfortunately did not manifest. On further investigation, the issue is the Jubilee Park development. Because obviously, whilst our projections are modelled on um, birth rates, 
um, and live birth data. Unfortunately, we can't predict how many families are going to move into a new housing development in between their baby being born and that baby subsequently needed to start school. So I will say that the issue in that Rogerstone area is substantially arising from the Jubilee Park development. Um, fortunately, that development is almost complete. So again, we should see that levelling off over the next few years. But again, just to reassure you that um, this is now, you know, is something that we are continuing to look at and model. Rogerstone Primary and expansion to three form entry was originally included in our Band B programme, but we removed that about 18 months ago on the basis that the projections indicated a levelling off. So again, I mean, that, that's going to be something that we look at closely now when the new projections come out over the summer and probably again next year to look at whether we do need to, to, to maybe reinstate that under Band C. Thank you. Can I remind uh, can I remind questions and those given the questions, please, that um, we we're not here to um, relate to specific ward issues or specific schools within our our own areas of representation. Can we have a, can we have the questions um, generically about all schools and can we have the answer now? You've given a good answer. Um, uh, regarding Roger Stone. Can we have the wider answer now regarding the rest of Newport, please? Yeah, again, just to reassure you that we get projection data on an annual basis. So every year there's a, um, a, pupil, a, a data collection from schools, it's called PLASC. That generally happens in January and resulting from that, our new, the Newport Intelligence Hub will update the pupil projections based on transition rates, birth rates in the area over the last five years. And PLASC for 2021 has been delayed because of COVID, because schools were closed during or closed to the majority of pupils do in January. So the PLAS collection happened much later, which means our projections are going to come through later. But those projections will be analysed once they're through in the summer and that information will be reported through the Planning the School Places group and then into the Pupil Services Capital Programme board just to make sure that we are making the, the, the correct provision for all types of education across the city. Thank you. That's a fabulous, nice and tidy answer. <laughs> Bringing Thank everybody you. into it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fawcett, can you take put your hand down if it's no longer required up, please? Thank I'm you. I'm not able to put it down. It's no. um, only okay. under your control or democratic no, services. I, I can only put it up yeah. on that speak chat. Well, that's uh, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, OK, democratic services, anybody, can you monitor when people have spoken and take their hand down? And is there a reason as to why members can raise their hand and members can no longer lower their hand? Democratic admin. We do have control of it. We'll make sure that our members' hands are put down, Chair. Well, well, we're not keeping up to date with it, but members should be able to have the ability to raise their own hands and put their own hands down. Again, yeah, we can put uh, our hands up, but we can't put them down because it's yeah, a different know, facility, it's, isn't it? Well, no, it shouldn't be. It should be on the same. But however, OK, we'll look at that again. Something so, to do with gravity, I would suggest, yeah. <laughs> ah, 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 you know, uh, thank you, Councillor Richards. I do look forward to meeting you uh, socially again very soon. Um, there we go. Um, OK. Page 21. OK, on page 21, um, uh, page 21, yeah, it's not over, it has from page five. Again, um, you, the, the statement uh, towards the end there is um, the result in increasing costs when compared with the um, available budgets. Um, this continues to be a concern moving forward. It's so. Uh, how can you substantiate that comment for us better? And how are we addressing the concerns going forward? And um, there is a report that is going to cabinet at the July meeting 
which asks if we are able to maybe um, increase the amount of money that's been allocated to the band B program not through any additional funding from the council just to reiterate but there is an option for us to bid to Welsh government for more money so we are continuing to monitor the cost of the projects um, and, and obviously react accordingly um, the, the, the overall band B program at the moment stands at 75 million um, unfortunately the cost estimates indicate that that is not going to be sufficient for the projects that are still within that program Program. Um, we have reduced the program. We, we took a report to Cabinet uh, at the early part of lockdown last year to remove some of the lower priority projects and concentrate on, on the, the, the um, higher value projects, really. Uh, but the cost estimates coming through from our partners in Newport North indicate that the funding that we've now set aside is potentially not going to be enough. Um, they've put that down to um, issues arising from COVID and also from Brexit. So I think there's there's a combination of both of those factors which is significantly affecting the building trade and, and you know elected members on this call may already be aware of that from the, from other conversations that they're having. Um, we do look to value engineer projects where we can so where we feel that we can make cuts within a program within a project we will work with, with the, um, the, the developer and with the school to remove some aspects if we feel they are not going to provide value for money. But it's really important for us that we do get the most out of the programme as we possibly can. Now, with COVID and with Brexit, there is a view that things may calm down over the next few years. But unfortunately, they're not calming down at the moment. So we can only react really to the to the latest information that's available. And these latest cost estimates are based on the tender for the Welsh Medium Secondary School, Gwent East Coid, which is the last thing that we tendered on. Now, the, the, the programme at Baselag, those tenders came in last week and are being evaluated this week. So that may provide us with further up-to-date information once that has all been quantified. So it continues to be something that we're monitoring on a regular basis. And I would just like to reassure members that we are providing that challenge around that. We know that they, you know that there is not an infinite amount of money, and we're acutely aware of that. And we are managing within the funding that's available to us, albeit, as I said, we are asking we are going to be asking cabinet for permission to go to Welsh government to bid for additional funding, which will not have an impact on the council. Thank you for that, Councillor Marshall. Thank you. Um, just literally linked on this, um, as members of school governors, Norse does come up um, from time to time in relation to, to costings, um, and it does question um, school governors about which way they want to go, whether or not they want to go through Norse or through other providers. Um, but it's just a, a question about sometimes the feeling of tediousness about if they don't go through Norse, about all the checks they've got to do and everything else like that there. Um, is there any ability to um, maybe do some extra sessions maybe with governors about utilising um, providers and things like that there because some still seem a little bit unsure about how to move forward um, especially chairs and governors and things like that the number of questions that come up in from my own personal experience and I don't know if members share the same um, but I just feel it's an area that maybe we need to consider and maybe actually look at at that but also the fact of you know some recognition maybe of understanding of the costs and what they, they go into because as mentioned you know, it, it's one of the things when Norse comes up, it's cost straight away. It's one of those, you know, buzzwords that we, we all hear. Um, so it'd be just nice to, if that could be, you know, looked into, please. Thank you. Definitely, I can speak to Norse about arranging some sessions if you think that would be helpful across the city, Councillor Marshall. Please, thank you. No problem. OK, thank you. That was uh, 21. Uh, 22. Uh, OK, yes, Councillor Watkins. Councillor Watkins, I can't see you, maybe on mute. Councillor Watkins, you're on mute. It's still on mute, Councillor. OK, whilst um, Whilst Councillor sorts that out, uh, I'm going to speak on page 22, and that's the capacity of Tredegar Park Primary School is increased from 420 to 525, uh, with, the ex with the effect from September uh, 2000, uh, of 2021 to show that adequate provision exists within uh, exists for the children within the uh, local area. 
Um, this proposal has been deferred and will be revisited in the autumn. What impact has this had um, upon the school and upon the facility there? So okay. Impact of that Chair, I, just to record that I have an interest in this as I'm chair of the governors of Tradiga Park Primaries. That's fine, noted. Okay, D just to say that, that in terms, I, I spoke earlier about the fact that our pupil projection models are regularly updated. Uh, the the pre projections do indicate that the demand in that area is not going to manifest as early as we thought it was going to do. So we haven't got that burgeoning demand coming through yet. So we, it has given us some breathing space to enable us to take this proposal forward. And um, the, the reason for the delay um, is uh, I, I, obviously Councillor Watkins is familiar with the school. He's the elected member for the area and he's the chair of governors. But for those of you who don't know, um, Tradiga Park Primary School is um, in a floodplain. Lots of you will, will recall the issues we had in establishing the Welsh Median Secondary School on the, the, the John Frost site. And um, Tradiga Park Primary School is in a very similar location. So uh, whilst we've had funding through a Welsh Government grant to expand the school from two form entry to two and a half form entry, conversations with our colleagues in planning have indicated that it might be very difficult to get planning permission to build on the site given the issues with um, flooding in that area and the challenge that we would get from Natural Resources Wales. So we are looking to seek alternative ways of utilising that funding and still expanding the school. Now that is um, that has put a little bit challenging uh, because there uh, there they may be additional capacity on the school site, but it would require um, us making alternative provision for other partners in the area. So kind of a reallocation of capital resources in the area. So I just want to, to, to reassure members who are on this call that that work is ongoing uh, between education and regeneration investment and housing to identify whether we can um, move partners to, to um, other parts of the city and therefore maybe utilise the space that's already in the school um, to, to achieve this. But like I said, just to give you some, some reassurance as well, our pupil projection model indicates that that, that that burgeoning demand is not going to manifest just yet. So it's given us that little bit of breathing space. OK, thank you very much for that. OK, um, OK, where are we? Can I request, Chair? Who's that, Tom? Yes, please, Chair. May I, can we have a five-minute break? Because I, I've got to go somewhere, Chair, please. Yes, we shall. We shall now move to a counter break. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Chair. Neil, can you um, note that, Neil? Um, the microphone. We can't pause it, so if you just want to turn off your mic, it's okay. So Neil, could you turn your um, your volume up a bit, please? OK, thank you.
Okay, there we go. I don't know if everybody's back yet. I'm here, Dre. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's difficult when you when you rely on um, audio only. I suppose you know. You so am I, Dre. Are you on audio too? I'm glad you're back. Come yeah. on, lovely to hear you. Thanks, Bill. You're Thank very, you. Very welcome. Have we all turned? Are we happy that we're all back now? I um, guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay. Page, um, we're going to continue now. Uh, no more questions there. Uh, page 23. Anybody there? Uh, okay. I have an observation on page 23. It's on. It's on item 13. A liaison finance partners of school was created uh, to create a substantial model to deliver uh, and to ensure children with assisted learning needs are provided with timely intervention without a prescribed budget, uh, with a prescribed budget, without year on year fluctuation. I see this has been, um, I understand it's been uh, delayed due to COVID. Uh, I want to just raise this to the awareness of the committee and to the officers and if we could pass it on to the cabinet member that we wish to keep a close eye on this and um, and can we have the, an answer as to when we're likely to be back on track with it, please? Sure. So um, there's a regional project um, that's taking place to to project the long term ALN needs of Newport and the region, so um, five local authorities. So there's a company called Masterton C has been commissioned mm -hmm. to do this. It's one of, the, I think it's the only company in the UK that's got the, the ability to carry out these projections. So the report is delayed, but it's, it's due out in July, so it's it's imminent. So, so that's one part of it is what are our long term needs for people with ALN. Alongside that, we want to make sure that it aligns to the requirements of the new ALN Act that's about to come into place from Welsh Government. As I touched on earlier, there's still elements of that that we're waiting for Welsh Government to publish through their commencement orders in terms of um, the timescale in which groups of learners um, will come under the Act over the next couple of years. So the review of the funding formula has started, but it's it's reliant on this report from Masterton C plus the commencement orders. So um, I can certainly keep I'm scrutiny up to date on the progress, but the Masterton C report, as I say, is out in July. The ALN transformation comes to place from September. So I think in reality it's from September that it, it can really start to progress with pace. Good, I look forward to uh, reading those various reports and the progress of it. Uh, OK, page 25. Chair, Chair could I yep. just ask the supplementary on that point, please? Yes, of course you can, Councillor. I, I was getting a bit confused then. Um, Andrew's answer was that we're awaiting on Welsh Government uh, sort of final legislation, I suppose. And then he refers to consultants, Masters and C. Who's leading on this? The Welsh Government or Masters and C? So we as the local authority are leading on it, but the Masters and C has been commissioned as a regional report for the five local authorities. Um, plus it was it was better value for money in doing it that way. So that's looking at the long term pupil needs. Um, once once we know the needs, and we know the scale of this new national legislation that's come in place. Um, as a local authority, you can determine um, the funding formula that aligns to it and the provision that's needed across Newport. OK, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Chairman. 
Really welcome, uh, Councillor Richards. Uh, page 24, 25, 26, 27. And I know that Councillor Forsey has indicated she has a question on page 28. Councillor Forsey. Um, so there was a confusion between whether you're taking the report page numbers or the overall agenda pack no. page numbers. So I've asked my question. Thank you. That's OK. I'm taking the report page number. There's two. We, can, we, we have two page numbers. We have a 37 and a 28. Um, that's Chair, right. I've got one on here as well for um, the one you're on. On 28? On 28 of the report, so yeah. improve learner voice and decision making. OK, go for it. Thank you. Um, as members are aware, um, I was in youth assembly at the time that it was uh, made legal for school councillors to be established um, and for learner voice to, to be put in place. Um, I'm just a little bit concerned on the report that it noted about the fact that there's still some barriers um, of the youth council itself trying to get into school councils um, and just what you know the, the local authority is trying to do to break down those barriers to ensure that learner voice is heard on all levels um, where it should be and what are the barriers um, um, you know, and, and just making sure it's not a to tokenistic gesture. Um, it is the full on approach that we do listen and learn from our learners. Thank you. Um, I, I can reassure you, Councillor Marshall, that there is there is a significant amount of really positive work um, being undertaken in relation to young people's voice and their involvement in decision making. And in fact, um, the chairperson of the Youth Council has actually presented this morning at the Attendance and Wellbeing Forum, which is attended by all schools um, and leaders from all schools across Newport, and um, spoken to head teachers and other senior leaders about greater communication between the youth council and school councils, and greater communication between the schools councils and the youth councils, so that vice versa process, because Whilst the youth work, a youth council is doing some brilliant work, we have to ensure that that message is getting down to school councils so that school councils can disseminate that information and um, feed them back up to the youth council. So we're looking at different strategies for doing that. And for us, there are some really strong links with secondary schools because it is it tends to be that age of young people who are um, either uh, involved with the youth council or have friends on the youth council. So there's, the, there's good communications there. But what we need to do is develop that practice with primary schools. And so the links with primary schools was one of the aspects of development that the chair of the youth council was focusing on with head teachers and senior leaders this morning. I can absolutely say that the Youth Council have provided some outstanding support for schools over the last year and developed really strong links with um, senior leaders across schools. They have generated uh, a guidance booklet that's been shared with all schools to um, support them with the delivery of the LGBTQ plus curriculum and um, ideas for activities for supporting young people. They have taken part, uh, a leading part in the development of the new anti-bullying guidance and the model policy that's been circulated to schools. And in fact, the Youth Council were instrumental in gaining the views of over 1,200 young people. That uh, was integral to, to that piece of work. The Youth Council have also um, developed a young person's version of the Learn Well strategy, which is the wellbeing strategy for education that has also been shared shared with schools. So despite the fact that um, there has been less time in school over the, the last year in particular, the work of the Youth Council and the message that they are uh, giving to schools and the level of communication that they're providing to schools has actually been increased over the last 12 months. What we have to though make sure that we do is ensure that there's our engagement with primary schools, which is a priority for us at the moment. Does that answer and reassure Councillor Marshall? 
Yes, thank you. I've actually just looked at who the chairperson is, so I might have to declare an interest, which is Maisie Evans, who is actually one of my St John cadets, which I didn't actually realise she was chair. So <laughs> She's outstanding. I, I think it's fair She's to say. She's an amazing doing, young person, definitely. And a, you know, really, really positive job, as are the other men, members of the definitely. Youth Council. I obviously yeah. from that um, through through the chair, just to, the fact to make sure that, you know, if there is barriers to let us know as members as well, because I think, you know, as school governors as well, we can maybe, you know, apply and make sure that the pupil voice is listened to at all levels um, and we can use our influence uh, as and where possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. On the same point, uh, which, which actually goes over from 28 to 29, uh, we are putting a lot of investments uh, on, on and, and listening to the thoughts of the Youth can, can Council, and that's a part of the Estin rec recommendation for. How many members? What's the current membership of the Youth Council? I believe that the membership is around twelve young people, but Councillor Routley, I'll confirm that for you following the the meeting. What's the um? What's the maximum numbers of members on the Youth Council? Again, I'll confirm that for you after the meeting. I believe it's 50, isn't it, though? It, it is quite a large number. It's, uh, it's 50 because it, it mirror images, unless other members can help, can help me out. I believe it mirror images uh, the City Council. Chair, I can add into that from experience when I was on it. I know that each um, school actually sent members, so it's built slightly separately and organisations get to send representatives as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a complete shadow of our council, um, but is a, a attempt or reflection of all youth organisations, schools um, and young people generally for, from uh, across the, the, the council area. I think what I'm, what I'm trying to... Chair, can I come in here? Just a second, no, no. What I'm trying to, just a second. What I'm trying to indicate here is we are putting a lot of, of investment into them uh, and into their thoughts and ideas. And I'm trying to see whether or not they are entirely representative of the people that they represent. With a number of 11 or 12, 11, I think my indication was it was 11. Um, the, I, I just struggle to see um, maybe maybe we we need to examine um, examine how you know, we we need to establish a few things I suppose how many can they take I still think it's uh, it's, it's it's up to fifty um, but we have we have eleven which is which is pretty pretty poor in the representation state. It is funded by uh, an external body. We pay for someone else to run it and to facilitate that. I'm just concerned that are we actually getting, uh, are we actually getting the right thoughts that represent the right amount of opinions from our young people if only 11 and I'd like to know how many attend on a regular basis. So, you know, we, those questions I think need to be answered. And, and Councillor Wrightley, I'd, I'd be more than happy to ask the um, the still, lead I mean, on it, participation to support with uh, answers. And then there was two. Were there, were there two speaker? Oh, or, thank you. Bye. Who, who was that? I can't. Um, Sorry, Councillor Cleverly still was on. Sorry, the, my phone the, rang. Um, I oh, just a second, Councillor. Can I need to come in just, and speak on this? Councillor Cleverly, just just a second, please. You okay. you were we were picking up your telephone conversation when the officer was speaking and reporting back. Could you? I apologise for that. That's okay. Can you report back again, please? Um, what I can do, Councillor Routley, is ask for the policy and partnership team to provide an update because obviously the Youth Council have a wider remit than simply an education. Um, mm -hmm. they, I think we we utilise them well in terms of providing feedback for schools, but they have that wider role across the Council as well. So I'm happy to provide um, 
uh, all members of scrutiny with um, an update on the numbers of young people who are currently in the Youth Council, the numbers who attend regularly, the maximum number of young people, and perhaps an overview of some, some of the other aspects of their, their work as well. Thank you very much indeed. Sure, if I can come in, if you wouldn't mind as well, on the, the basic experience that those 11 active members will be active, and I'm sure that they do a lot of consultation work and they are reflective of the, the organisations. Um, and if the chair would allow me to divulge, as um, a youth officer in another organisation, I do get asked a lot for both representation of questions to consult with young people. Um, as you said, it's not just education, but if no. I can bring it back, maybe a little bit if the chair will allow can we have a look at if there's any barriers within schools and if there's schools not sending representatives where they should be can we also um be strong-handed if you you know on that side to make sure that they are because i think you know in the education side that is something that we can ask for here in this meeting and i think it's imperative for the future generations to understand what their education is especially during this time of covid and covid recovery we want to hear what experiences they've had to move forward and i'm not trying to put words in their mouth but it'd be very interesting to hear of the reflections and experiences um, so we can maybe look at that as well so if the chair further allows me to divulge maybe asking them to come to to a future meeting so we can learn about them um, in an information session and give us experiences of the work but maybe experiences of how they fit in and what they're asked about as well thank you i think there's two things there uh chair council marshall the first thing is um that um making in, ensuring that uh that we we do everything we can as a as a council i suppose rather than this this committee that uh that schools are encouraged as much as they can to send or to uh promote uh members to join this council that could be uh neil that could be a recommendation at the end of this report as well uh maybe Maybe we'll go back and examine whether they should come be, be, be before us. Let's establish the facts because we don't have them here. Um, you, you're going to find out about um, how many attend on a regular basis, the official number we've got, how many can 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 we can we have? I think 11 is pretty poor. Um, I'm more. I'm, I'm happy with the recommendation to encourage schools to be more become more active and to encourage members to to uh, take their place on this youth council um, and so neil if we could uh, tie that into a, a recommendation please well do chair thanks thank you okay thank you very much indeed uh, when you when you get that information for for us uh, can you make sure that all members are circulated with a copy of it, please. Of course. Thank you very much indeed for your help. Uh, page 30. Page 31. Page 32. OK. Page 32, I've got seven here. Well, Okay, on page 32, um, item 5, I think it is, uh, the development of regional management move protocol between Welsh secondary schools. Um, I notice that this is uh, being delayed. Uh, I wonder, can you add where, where we are now and where we will be um, by the time the next uh, neat review is uh, produced? Um, Chair, can I ask Katie Reese to provide a report on this specific item? Please do, please. Thank you. So th that will follow as a written report then, Chair. Sorry. Um... Uh, you're unable to answer that question? Yeah, so Katie Reese, the head of inclusion, is not at work at the moment. And okay. so Katie is our representative on this regional group that's developing the management. Well, we are, again, circulate to all, all members of the committee then, please. Thank you. Yeah. 
OK, page 32, uh, page 33. And there we go, page 34. Anybody on 34? Uh, 35, 36. Nothing. Okay, page 47, 48, 49, 50. Okay, I think that's the end of it as far as uh, you guys are concerned. Um, Andrew, Deborah, and 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 Co. Uh, can I thank you for coming and 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 eloquently and answering all the questions that were put to you in various orders. You were. You were very, very well versed today, and uh, and it's refreshing to see that every one of you is on top of um, your work portfolio. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you members for the the excellent questions that were were raised. Thank you, um, Neil. We need to uh, move on now. Um, that's right, Chair. It's just so we can take the comments and recommendations for the officers and the cabinet members. Um, some of the things that I've taken down at the moment, um, we've got the comments that Councillor Richards made about the priority for education in regards to um, the weapons. Um, the special schools having the calming rooms, um, Katie Reese to give us a written response for that. Um, the schools using the reserves that Councillor Fawzi mentioned. Um, that was uh, just a reassurance that that work is taking place. We'll have the numbers of how many pupils are out of county as well. Um, the review of school funding formula and Deb Weston are given the information for that as well. Um, Councillor Marshall's comment about uh, Norse to arrange sessions for governors to how to use, utilize the um, providers. And is there any additional comments or recommendations the committee would like us to take forward? Neil, there was a, about the Youth Council, please, as well. Yeah. Got that. Thanks, Councillor Marshall. And also, we're going to um, wait a, a written response on page 32, item 5. Effective arrangements are in place for manage. It's the discussions are taking place with Surit inclusion, and that is an agreement in process. There was going to be. Chair, can I add in something to this, if you don't mind, and ask if it's um, something that we are consulting on or in the report, if there is work that's been undertaken by the Youth Council, could we maybe have copies of that along with like our appendices or documents? Um, it'd be really interesting to actually hear what they have to say as part of maybe our scrutiny as well. Um, I think that would be a really good um, thing to, to, to do for us um, to understand from their perspective as well as part of our scrutiny. Thank you. Last bit note, it came to Marshall. Thank you. Yeah, I've got no issues. So, okay. Yeah, uh, yes, job. Go ahead. Sorry, um, I, I I raised this issue of uh, weapon crime and awareness, and, and mm -hmm. I think it is a very serious issue, based on what I've seen recently That's in the press and on the media. But um, the the interesting thing today, I mean, we are elected members. And, and this this is an issue that does involve youth and young people, yeah. and it may be an opportunity for us to tie in with the Youth Council with any move or progress that we make on discussion on this very, very serious and important subject. Thank you. Good idea. Uh, can I just add into this the need to um, review the school places in areas of Newport? As you said, there are several areas in Newport yes. where there's substantial um, house building being undertaken and, and the need to ensure that we do have um, sufficient facilities to, to go with this house building. OK, I'm not quite sure how we do that, but yes, yes, is the answer. I think they've got a good handle on it. I'm not quite sure what the 
Methodist, but so maybe we could write to um, uh, Deb Weston as she gave the, the answer to the original question and and uh, and put that into a, uh, into um, some kind of question for her. Neil. See that last note in chair, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's on a slightly different matter this, but um, I, I wonder whether we could have um, a, a member briefing on the curriculum for Wales. At some point in the future. Is that a, a full council member briefing? Yes, council members, yes. I mean, you could. I suppose you could write, could you not, could we not write to the cabinet member? I mean, it, it's a matter for the cabinet member, but I, I do, I do get your, uh, yeah. There's a lot of changes members? coming in, isn't there, in oh, September 22? Yeah, yeah. I can certainly check with officers against the force to see if something like this could be arranged. Um, as soon as I get the information, I'll let the committee know as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fortin. Is there anything else that people would like to add? Okay. Okay. Well, we've got the work, uh, the forward work program before us as well. Um, that's on page 51. Is you know, there's nothing else I, I can't see at the moment. Okay. Are we content with that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. OK. OK, then. Right. OK, we're going to draw the meeting to an end again. Thank you for uh, your patience and diligence this morning. Uh, don't forget, Neil, as strong as you can. Can we can we ensure that the cabinet member, Councillor uh, Mayor, has um, has our comments as well? Certainly, Chair. I'll send those immediately to Council Mayor. Yeah, because it needs to be resolved because we have uh, we have a council coming up Tuesday, a week mm -hmm. Tuesday, and uh, well, there we go. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Nothing else to say. Uh, goodbye, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.